welcome in everybody. We're going to give folks 30 more seconds to join in and then we'll get started. Okay, we are a little bit past the top of the hour. So again, welcome everyone. We have a great webinar for you today and a great group of presenters. Just a few housekeeping notes to start off with. We are recording today's webinar and we'll be sending a follow-up email to all of you with a link to the recording and slides. We have a few slides to kick off the webinar, but when we shift to the panel discussion, please feel free to customize your screen by clicking and dragging on the slides and media player to adjust the sizes on your screen. And if there is time, we will have a question and answer period at the end of the webinar using the Q&A function located in your toolbar. So please feel free to type in your questions at any time and we will get to them at the end. Again, we have a great webinar for you. To start, I'd like to send it over to you, Sally Lyons-Wyatt for the introduction. Sally, the floor is yours. Thanks, Joe, and thanks everyone for joining us. This is, as Joe talked about, our 2023 edition of the U.S. CPG growth drivers and growth leaders, excuse me. And we are here to talk about what were the things that drove growth for these leaders um, in their respective categories. We have spent um, months trying to go through and not only look at the numbers, but to understand what were the themes that really resonated with um, the brands that were able to find growth. Because as we all know, it's been hard to do so over the last couple of years. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to my partner, Carrie, Cara Lloyds. Cara? Thank, thank you, Sally. One. So just to, to set up on the context of the report, this is our 12th annual uh, report for the uh, CPG growth leaders. Um, and one that is unique in its ability to accurately measure total omni-channel performance and study the drivers of that performance at the same time. So some housekeeping, we're looking at companies with above $100 million in sales across CPG retail channels. Um, so that's over 600 companies. And comparing companies across their peer set to other in, uh, similarly sized companies and finally uh, decomposing that growth into what were the drivers uh, for our leaders in 2023. So some of the, uh, the measures behind it and the analytics behind it, um, this slide just summarizes how we're breaking down and comparing companies. Um, so we're looking at these top, uh, these five buckets of sizes. So those, um, and today we're focusing on the conversation on $1 billion plus manufacturers, which we break into $8 billion and above, two and a half to 8 billion and one to two and a half billion. On Thursday, we'll also be talking with uh, some of our clients in the underneath $1 billion uh, size group, uh, of which we break out between 500 million and a billion and 100 and 500 million. If you go down, we're, we're breaking the performance into both retail sales growth and market share performance, both dollar and volume. Um, so the, the way that we are ranking these companies is a composite score based on, on these four measures. And then finally, as we look at who are the drivers and what are the drivers of their perform performance, we're looking across all different types across um, Circana's assets uh, and wide uh, data range. Uh, so consumer, pricing, media, promotion, distribution, and, and so on. And that's what uh, will bring together the uh, discussion today and then uh, part of the, the full report that will be available uh, in a week, a couple of weeks. So just a quick setup on where we are uh, with the industry. Um, in the Thought Leadership Group, we spend our time looking across uh, CPG. Um, so the, the U.S. market in this year continue to see high uh, percent growth versus a year ago. That's the, the purple bar, the dollar sales growth rate. Um, and as we know, this was a lot driven by, by price. On average for the year, price grew 6.1%, um, but that came down from 10% in the beginning of the year to 3% by the end of the year. Um, so that kind of that lapping and the incremental price inflation slowing down by the end of the year. 
Fortunately, at the same time, our volume has mostly unwinded itself from the highs that we saw in 2020. Um, so while overall volume declined in 2023, the, uh, by the end of the year, we're starting to see that mostly unwound um, and starting to kind of flatten out and, and starting to grow. Um, and as we look through 2024, will be the key differentiator uh, in, uh, in driving growth. Key trends within the market, um, trading down both outside of CPG to CPG, in which case CPG benefits from the kind of do-it-yourself, as well as within CPG from higher brands um, to store brands and, and better value. And additionally, value channel capturing a greater portion of uh, larger trips overall uh, and accounting for more of the everyday pricing um, that consumers are using versus high-low. Uh, promotional spend. Now, as we break down the the, act, the analytics behind the the drivers of growth, uh, what we're doing here is uh, looking at the the growth drivers for our growth leaders versus other companies. And one thing that's interesting is that you know the, the price growth in 2023 was so consistent across the market that we don't see price as a as a differentiator in our top companies' performance. Um, really kind of the distribution and velocity uh, or key differentiators between the growing companies and, and other companies. Um, however, when you get to that, the kind of smaller size companies, we do see um, more premiumization being driven along with, um, with distribution and uh, velocity as well. Now, collectively for our companies, uh, this is the distribution of dollar sales across CPG among these different size groups that we're talking about, as well as private label, and then less than 100 million being that remaining 15% of the market. So you can see in the, the middle bar here, what happened over the last several years has been more kind of driven by the pandemic, some decline in share for the largest companies as uh, su supply constraints hit. Um, filled in by some very, very small companies, particularly that 100 to $500 million range kind of filling in the gap there. As we come to more recently, a lot of those smaller uh, brands have gone away uh, and we can see the return strength of the, of the $8 billion plus companies, the, you know, continuing to drive growth uh, through scale. Also the, the kind of 500 to $1 billion niche collectively continuing to be the kind of key differentiators when companies reach that level and are, are consistently taking share and driving significant distribution growth. And with that, um, I'm gonna pass back to Sally to talk through our uh, uh, the results of our leaders this year. So without further ado, we are gonna unveil our growth leaders for 2023. In the 8 billion and above group, Constellation brand tops the list. You can see that there's several beverages, but we also have L'Oreal and P&G representing the broad scale of non-foods that they represent. When you move into the 2.5 to 8 billion range, we've got CJ Foods at the very top, um, joined in by some other amazing uh, companies that like Chobani and Frenary and McKee. And then when you get to the 1.2, the one to the 2.5 billion, um, Celsius, Elf, Bellring, Pharmavite, all are kind of top five. You will notice a few things about this before I go to the next page with our smaller group. First of all, in these companies of 1 billion and above, we only have five per group. That is because growth was just that much harder to get in 23. Uh, this means that the folks on this page have had to work extremely hard to get the growth that they have had to get consumers to opt in, given some very difficult macroeconomic situation in the world today. So I congratulate every company on this page. Um, but in addition, I want to congratulate the companies that are a billion dollars and below. And you can see that there was more growth within these two um, sectors. So 500, um, 500 to a billion, you see the top of the prime, but you can also see down the list, Idahoan, who has been on every single year we've done it. So we've done it for 12 years. They're very proud to say that they've been on it every single year. Um, Milo's, and you can keep going down with Nutribolt and, and some of the others on the list. 
when you look at the 100 to 500 um, sector, then you see Feastables at the top, but we also see some other brands and beverages like um, Beatbox, who will be joining us um, one of their founders will be joining us on Thursday. So we're super excited about that. Lisa, I do hear some feedback. I'm hoping it's not on the whole, because I do hear some feedback somewhere. Um, so congratulations to the rankings of our billion plus and our less than super exciting. Um, to be able to unveil it today. and um, But what we thought would be even more important is to talk about what did we find as some of the leading drivers of the, the brands that were able to find growth. And one of the very first ones is integrated engagement. This is all around connecting to consumers um, from in and out of the store into their home, finding ways of talking to them in a united way and getting that message across and in a seamless integrated approach. So that could have been done with traditional media, also with influencers, events, ambassadors, a, a sundry of different ways. And we'll hear some of those as we get open to the panelists. Continuous newness, you know, isn't just about innovation. Um, we, what we saw was kind of ongoing innovation and bringing news into the categories in which they compete. Um, maybe that's with larger and smaller introductions, new attributes. It could also include fun, but also practicality. We did see that consumers are willing to pay for premium products, which some of the newness was that, but it wasn't just this one and done. Many of these companies were bringing in products from their different portfolio, within their portfolio, from different brands um, within the portfolio to help drive that continuous newness. Premium and value bifurcation. It's funny because whenever we talk about this, people are like, well, you just said people trade down, but now you're saying they trade up. Well, they're doing both. Um, it is complex, but we're seeing that consumers will indeed opt in for premium when we, they want to have that out-of-home experience in the home. They're willing to pay for that. If there's something that can offset those benefits that it brings, they'll pay that extra um, for that. So we're going to share, again, some stories around that. Embedding AI for operational prowess. So typically, we wouldn't even talk about AI, but AI has really become a part and parcel to how many of these companies are finding ways to take out cost or speed. Um, and we started to see that in managing supply costs, forecasting. But probably um, one of the ones that I found most exciting is what several companies are doing with AI around marketing effectiveness, being able to use it to digitize some of their social digital, to be able to have different messages going to different consumers, um, leveraging it for product innovation, trying to zero in on how they can do different innovations over the course of time faster with the use of AI. So these are our four drivers for the 2023 growth leaders. And now um, this will give you the full swath of the other themes that we found as we went down below. And some of these aren't new, right? So multi-benefit and convenience. Um, multi-benefit, we've seen that for several years. It continues to be one of those top drivers. It isn't just great to have hydration. You have to have hydration plus maybe energy or performance or well-being. Um, from a convenience standpoint, it's not only convenience of being able to find it when you're out, but also convenience for from a packaging perspective. Fun and indulgence, nostalgia, comfort, flavor, taste quality, simple ingredients. You can see these. So the, the kind of those different trends that are beneath the four that I just shared with you before, are very similar to what we've seen in the past, but just we feel like they've upped the game, gone a little bit more premium as many of these, um, and definitely it resonated with consumers. So now let's find out how these companies were able to find that growth. We're going to open this up and introduce you to the three panelists we have. So we have Shannon Durham. She's a Senior Vice President, Commercial Development of Chobani. So we're excited to have Shannon. Rhonda Hoffman, who is the Chief Growth Officer for Pharmavite. 
Anne Mike McGrew, who is our EVP Chief Communication Strategy ESG and Diversity at Constellation Brands. So with that, we are now going to open this up and let you listen to these amazing companies and what they did in order to drive growth. But my first question, and I'm going to go to um, Shannon first, is what were the key challenges in CPG um, in 23 from your perspective and what were the drivers of your success? Thank you. It's great to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. Good to see you. Um, and thanks for a wonderful panel this afternoon. I'm excited to be here and talk to you a little bit. Um, you mentioned some of the challenges that I think we all faced in CPG in 23, but um, cer certainly we saw con continued pressure as inflation continued to kind of shape purchasing power for the consumer. Um, we saw overall unit declines and softness across the total store. So those are um, sort of as they as the consumer trades in and out of channels, in and out of um, their shopping patterns, they became more discretionary in their purchasing power, and we saw those um, that softness kind of uh, live on, if you were, if you will, in in 2023. Thank you, Mike. How about you? Yeah. You know, I would say we saw many of the same things. And I think, you know, from the standpoint of our business and our industry, for, for those that aren't aware, Constellation Brands is a beverage alcohol company. We're across beer, wine, and spirits with brands like Corona, Modelo, Pacifico, Naomi, Kim Crawford, Prisoner Wine Company, High West, yada, yada. So, um, you know, from our standpoint, the only thing I would add, it might be a little different from what was already said, is, is shifting preferences amongst our consumer base as they're looking for, you know, options that promote a sense of betterment or better for you, uh, more flavor, more flavorful options, and then, uh, you know, that offer more convenience uh, for their active lifestyles. And so, you know, I, I think from our standpoint, uh, the thing that, that we've benefited from is a consistent and disciplined approach uh, to, to the way consumers at the forefront of everything that we do. We spend a lot of time constantly talking to consumers, uh, gaining insights that give us clues as to why they choose us, the meaning of our brands in their lives and day-to-day -day activities uh, and their motivations. And so, you know, we kind of leverage those insights, uh, I think in a lot of our marketing communications to dramatize that then and play it back to them in ways that, that resonate emotionally. Uh, and, you know, for us, I, I think that speaks to, you know, the, the, the strength of our brands. We've been able to build brands of people, we, you know, our mission is to build brands that people love and they come, they come back to time and time again. Uh, you know, the strength of our brands, I think, has yielded uh, 55 consecutive quarters of growth um, and counting. So uh, it's yielded uh, our presence on, on this top 10 list uh, for, I think, the past 11 years. We may not have all 12, but, um, and, and so, you know, that, that would be the only thing I would say was a little different from our standpoint. Well, but you touched on some of the trends that I showed on the pages before around re kind of relevance. You use preferences, but that means you were relevant with what consumers were looking for. You talked about flavors, convenience, um, but that whole consistent discipline, I think, is probably one of the marks of why you've been on the growth leaders list for the last 11 years. So um, that's impressive. Um, and last but not least, um, let's see, I would love Rhonda to weigh in. Sure, um, happy to. I think you know it's what was remarkable to me is how the the trends that impacted 2023 really transcended multiple categories because ours is fairly consistent and we see consumers settling into whatever their new normal is in a post pandemic world that we're all living in, um, and we saw a real um, need for consumers to seek out the experience from the various categories where we compete while also looking for the right value proposition for them. And so that really played a key role for our business. Um, and for our success, it, it always goes back to our people and just really having a day in and day out focus on living up to our purpose, which we exist to bring the gift of health to life for our consumers. And when when we all rally around that, it's really easy to do the right thing for the consumer and for the business. And I think that's really been pivotal in our ability to transform the company over the last several years. Very helpful. And I think, you know, that seeking out the value proposition, I thought that was pretty profound because 
that also changes, but you have been able to evolve and pivot and be um, be able to uh, to find it and then be able to align with the consumer. And obviously you did it quite well. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, it's a delicate balance to strike, right? You're trying to manage the cost dynamic that our businesses are facing um, in this environment that we're operating in, but still give the consumer the right value that they're looking for so that your brand can continue to win at the shelf. It makes sense. Thank you. That may be a good segue to talk about um, the, the consumer and shopper trends um, that have driven the market in, in 2023 and, and how that's evolving moving forward. Uh, Mike, maybe we start with you. You talked about kind of the gaining insights and, and using that in your marketing communications. What do you, what are specifically the, the consumer trends and shopper trends um, that you feel are occurring and how are you adjusting? Sure. There, there, are, there are a number of them that impact our business and that we watch and that we've responded to. Uh, premiumization, you guys have talked about that a little earlier. You know, in a high inflationary environment, folks are watching. They're, they're spending a little more carefully. But, you know, in the wine segment, as for instance, uh, what we've done is we've migrated our portfolio upstream. Uh, to focus on higher end brands because that's what's that's what's commanding or driving growth uh, within that category uh, in particular and that that impacts our beer business our imported beer business uh, as well so there are still folks a uh, good swath of folks that are choosing higher quality premium brands so premiumization is one of those those trends i think for us if you look at our beer business the growth and influence of the hispanic demographic uh, in the u.s uh, their, their influence on on culture um, and, and, and taste preferences. I, I think that has benefited uh, our brands. Our brands have been uh, part of uh, those families' uh, histories and traditions for many, many years. They resonate. Uh, that, that demographic over indexes to, to beer consumption in particular and, and our brands in, in particular. Uh, and so, you know, it's something uh, that it serves as a bit of a tailwind uh, for us. Uh, we want to make sure that you know we continue to to operate in a way and, and uh, market our brands in a way that resonates highly resonates with with that demographic and so that's that that's uh, an, an added kind of element uh, that that impacts our business as well and then some of the things that I talked about before uh, betterment so you know over the years um, low offering low and no alcohol options within our portfolio Corona non alk is actually performing very well it was one of the uh, more uh, better performing introductions in the non-elk space uh, that, that was introduced last year, Modelo Oro, uh, which was on uh, one of your slides. It's, you know, lower calorie, lower carb op option to the, the more full-bodied Modelo Especial. Kim Crawford uh, is a very popular Sauvignon Blanc, Blanc for us uh, in, in the wine sector. We've, we've offered a lower calorie, lower alcohol uh, content uh, version of that called Kim Crawford Illuminate. And same thing with uh, Mayomi. Pinot Noir, Miami Bright uh, is a low, uh, low alcohol, low calorie, uh, lower calorie option. So we've tried to really adhere to that betterment, uh, sense of betterment. And then flavor, from a flavor standpoint, uh, you know, in our Modelo family, we've, we've introduced a series of Modelo Chaladas, which is essentially flavored, flavored beer. Um, which really uh, is helping us tap into the female dem demographic and younger consumers that crave more flavor. So hitting a different profile and being incremental in terms of the value add to our business. Uh, about a year or two ago, we introduced a brand called Modelo Agus Frescas, which is uh, a brand, uh, it's it's a nitrogen carbonated uh, uh, drink, very flavorful, but it mimics uh, uh, your traditional Agus Frescas, which you can find in, in Mexico, so authentic in the way this brewed. And then, um, you know, we've introduced very recently uh, Corona uh, Sunbrew, uh, which uh, again is a is a essentially a flavor wheat wheat flavored uh, beer, uh, very light in orientation uh, that we think will resonate with consumers. We're we're very uh, 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 we're very much looking forward to how that performs in market. And then the only other thing that I would say is, you know, from the standpoint of uh, evolution of trends at retails, you know, we've been able to work with retailer partners uh, across the country, introducing a concept called Shopper First Shelf. Uh, in which we will go in and, and help with planograms that help organize the assortment, the flow, uh, the product mix on shelf, uh, the amount of space that's allocated towards brands. That shelf at retail is precious. Uh, you want to make sure that you're, you're, you're maximizing space for brands that are driving the highest velocity. 
uh, to get you that greatest return on investment. And we've seen uh, great adoption from that. And, you know, because of the velocity that our, our brands drive, uh, we've, we've been a, a very good uh, beneficiary of that. But that, that model is brand agnostic. It's literally trying to maximize uh, the sales opportunity at the retail shelf. So those are all trends uh, that factor into how we, how we think about our business and uh, that, that we activate against uh, on a daily basis. And I think those are key contributors uh, to our success as well. My curious also in the beer space, are there uh, different ways in which the shopper is, is shopping for um, alcohol and, and how that may be changing the way you approach? Different ways that they're shopping? Well, you know, with, with the shopper first shelf uh, kind of principle uh, goes by is, you know, it, it, in, in the way that they assort or manage flow, uh, there is there is a, a sequence to how, how they shop. Uh, from lower end value uh, brands to your domestics, uh, to your higher end uh, uh, import assortments, uh, to craft, uh, to flavor malt beverages, and, and then single, uh, you know, uh, single single size SKUs. And so, um, you know, I wouldn't say that that's necessarily a new phenomenon. What you are seeing is more the introduction of more products, you know, as companies are looking to maximize growth and looking for new avenues of growth. There are certain sectors within the beer category uh, that that are less, um, uh, I would say, not less relevant, but where sales have been declining for, and energy has been de uh, declining for a period of time, trying to introduce new variants that align with consumer trends. You're seeing a lot more shelf space allocated towards those those items, and you know the ability to actually develop marketing and branding materials that pop uh, and stand out on shelf. You know, those are all things that that I think are fa fairly new dynamics uh, within the industry. And, and Shannon, I would love to hear from you what your perspectives are, both shopper, consumer, uh, customer trends, and, and how you're adapting. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. From a, let's start with the retailer and the customer. I think they're still really, really focused on store growth, overall store growth, unit growth, unit movement velocity. Those are going to be key metrics for success for our customer partners. They want to see it. All categories growing, of course, but um, proud to report that we were number the number two manufacturer driving volume growth in the dairy aisle, um, and number six manufacturer in 2023 driving volume growth across the whole store. So that's going to be where retailers want to lean in. They want to partner with strong growth brands, um, and they want to see unit unit and velocities continue to increase. From a shopper standpoint, certainly. Um, Inflation is still top of mind for shoppers, um, a, a very varied environment for them to make choices. And we see many manufacturers and brands continue to take price in an already challenged consumer and shopper environment. Um, so our commitment from a Chobani standpoint is to continue to deliver products that support a full spectrum of needs, both for the shopper at shelf um, and evolving consumer needs. And we'll talk a little bit about what the consumer is saying to us, but they're looking for um, every, the shoppers looking for choice. They're looking for personalization. They want campaigns that speak to them where they are, meet them where they are. So we'll continue to lean into those areas. As we look to the consumer, um, we were founded on, uh, we have a founder mentality and philosophy, but we were founded on making better products that are accessible to everyone. And it's a really important to us that we maintain that accessibility, even in a challenged environment. Consumers are truly at the heart of everything we do. Um, we've been disruptive and innovative. Um, we're a bend toward inclusion, and that's been fueling our success. So we want to continue that mindset and, and speak to the consumer where they are. Um, a couple of additional consumer behaviors that Mike touched on too, but categories continue to evolve and consumers are shifting. They're looking for, in our area, specifically in food, they're looking for higher protein. They're looking for reduced sugar. They're looking for better for you, but they're also looking for some permissible indulgences. And you saw us on a previous slide in Chobani launching into areas where um, we have a right to play in permissible indulgence, better for you options. Um, so we'll continue to, to bring products to the market that meet those needs. In fact, 74 million consumers plan to increase their protein intake this year. Um, and 40% of consumers want better, more nutritious food and drink options wherever they are. And that includes food service. Um, and they want to, ultimately, consumers are telling us that they want products that meet their full family need. Um, households have changed through the pandemic. And as we establish our new normal, parents are looking for better for you options that they know their kids will eat 76% of the time. Um, that are healthy and that are quick to prepare or low 
low to prepare as far as time goes. Time is really important. And even non-parents are talking about multi-generational households and what we can do to help support them there. Um, we talked a little bit too about better for you options. Um, consumers are trying to clear the stakes on what con what's confusing. So they're looking at labels, they're reading about nutrition facts and they're educating themselves. Um, they're doubling down on things like flavor and really great tasting products. Um, and they want to see seasonal amplification as well. And that speaks a little bit to that personalization that we're seeing um, take hold as well. So I think there's there's a lot um, there's a lot happening in the space. I think if we can continue to partner with our retail customers, drive unit velocity and growth, and then personalize our offers for the shopper and deliver delightful food for the consumer, we can't we can't lose. Great. Thank you, Shannon. And, and Rhonda, what are you, what are your thoughts on this topic? Yeah, I think you know our category, not unlike the those you just heard about, it's um, become very fragmented. Um, it's always been a very highly fragmented category in dietary supplements. It's even more so, especially when you include e-commerce in the mix and think about it from an omni-channel perspective. So what we're hearing from consumers is an opportunity to streamline and simplify their supplementing regimen. And we're seeing consumers look towards what we call multi-purpose ingredients that can really serve mm -hmm. multiple needs. Um, my favorite example is magnesium, um, which is one of those multi-purpose minerals that consumers are looking for because it has the benefits of calming mood, muscle, bone, joint, relaxation. Right. Um, and we actually have seen consumers trade out of melatonin in favor of magnesium because they can get the benefits of a restful night's sleep in addition to many other benefits. So that's a trend that we're seeing from a consumer perspective. From a retailer perspective, like many other categories, the shelf is precious real estate. Um, and you know the conversation is great if you're launching 10 new items how are we optimizing your assortment so that it's the most productive that it can be? Um, and it's not necessarily just 10 new items added to the constrained space that we're all moving with at the shelf. Um, and so, you know, it creates a dynamic where the brand has to be a good steward of our assortment um, and what our brand is offering the consumer and then bringing together that consumer insight around simplification and streamlining so how do we do that with our retailers as our partner to make sure that the brand and the retail shelf are the best that it can be for that shopper and consumer when they get when they get to the retail store? Actually, I would love to keep you talking about that. So yeah. when you how did you when you were working with your brands and your retailers, were there some magic moments in 23 of how you went with a strategy for one of your brands it could have been mag it could have been magnesium or something else but was there some magic moment of getting it right that you were able to kind of click all the different buttons to then get consumers to a know about what you had to offer what the benefit was where it was available you had the right price was what was it that you did to get to that yeah, I think it goes back to, um, we all get romanced by the new technology that is at our disposal. I know we're gonna talk about AI later, um, which I think is really important as we look to the future of CPG. But for us, it goes back to really being hyper-focused on nailing the fundamentals. So what is your brand portfolio? What's the right assortment for each retailer? Because it's not the same for every retailer. It has to be very much tailored to their shopper and your brand. Um, and sometimes it even boils down to geography. Um, so it really was just taking a retailer, consumer and brand look at how we can optimize the portfolio and then making the right choices and identifying where did we have items that weren't performing where we and where we felt we had other new items or existing kind of core core items that could perform better for that retailer, um, and then just tailoring what that looked like retailer by retailer. Did you use? Do you use personalization? You use the word personalization, but do you use personalized messaging with what you do? We do, we do. Um, it's really more on a, a digital scale for us. 
um, we do have a, a personalized um, service on our site so we can tailor regimens for our consumer. Uh, but we do see personalization continuing to be a, a big trend in the supplementing space going forward. I think it's just going to manifest itself a little differently than it has in the past. Right. All right. Thank you. And Mike, you talked about Hispanics, females. You talked about younger generations trying to find a way to attract some of those into the Constellation portfolio. Um, how, what did you do to succeed to get to those consumers' cohorts? Yeah, I think for... Uh, I, I go back to we we have focused on building a culture in this company that we like to call as consumer obsessed. Uh, so that means everybody throughout the company, regardless of what your role is, has to find ways uh, to stay close to the consumer to gain insights uh, 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 related to our consumers. You know, we've uh, over the past several years spoken with 30,000 of our consumers, had conversations uh, with them to understand, you know, why they choose us, the association with our brands. And I think that influences our brand positioning, our marketing communications. It really taps into, uh, I think, those emotions and transports uh, consumers to a place that is relevant to them. So, you know, I'll use an example or a couple of examples. Um, you know, one of our Hallmark or flagship brands is Corona, Corona Extra, right? And so when everybody thinks of Corona, uh, where consumers think of Corona, they think of that beach state of mind, uh, which you can achieve in various arenas, if you will, but that beach state of mind and, you know, our most recent campaign or iteration of that, La Vida Mas Fina, Living the Fine Life, it kind of dramatizes that. And so when you think of Corona, it has a bit of a badging effect. It has an emotional appeal and it means something to the consumers uh, that choose uh, that brand, which makes it, you know, harder to switch, to be quite honest, uh, particularly because it's, it's attached to an emotional and, and you know, a, an aspect of their life. I think for us, you know, our campaign for Modelo Especial or the Modelo brand uh, in general, the mark of a fighter. So everyday reward for hard work and grit. The storytelling that, that we engage in, you know, we used to focus on celebrities and stories of how they, you know, came from humble beginnings, overcame a lot to, to, to achieve something, something great. Uh, now we're highlighting uh, everyday, um, you know, citizens in this country, uh, a grandmother that, you know, is, is working hard in the kitchen to make sure that, you know, as her family comes over for Sunday dinner, that, you know, everybody is having a great time creating memories as a, as a for instance. Um, you know, the story of a, a, a bartender and a local establish, uh, establishment who is, you know, working extremely hard during the course of the night to make sure that his patrons are taken care of so that they can relax uh, and unwind uh, from a week. And so, you know, I think in the way that we dramatize the insights that we gain uh, from why consumers uh, choose our brands, the meaning that it has in their lives, it, it, we've just been able to consistently and in line with the ethos of that brand from year to year to year, find ways to connect with our, our, our consumers in an emotional way. And I, I, and I think, you know, what we've done with brands like Modelo as a, for instance, is, you know, several years ago, uh, you know, when I, I joined the company about 10 years ago, um, uh, around that time, we had only marketed that brand to the Hispanic demographic, as a for instance. We've gone about an approach to make sure that we are uh, marketing and communicating in a way that uh, gains awareness but resonates with what we would call more general market consumers, but never straying away from the core attributes uh, that, that have made us strong for many, many years with our core the way that we dramatize or communicate to consumers about the value of this brand and what it stands for, their values that sort of resonate. Everybody can resonate with that mark of the fire, right? Everyday hard work and grit. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think our, our marketing teams in particular have done a, a masterful job uh, at that. And then, you know, somebody uh, mentioned earlier, you know, making sure that in the way that you uh, leverage your brand positioning, you're reaching consumers where they are, when they are um, in the in the manner that, that matters most to them, I think all of those things have, uh, have factored uh, into into our momentum over the years. All right, so that's amazing. And you actually started talking about emotional, and that made me think. So I'm coming to you, Shannon, about the emotional, physical, and mental well-being that consumers are really striving for. Um, I know Chibani has been trying to help that as well. So as I think about, you talked about trying to meet household needs. That was how you kind of started the last. One of the last questions that we asked you, how do you then talk about what did you do in order to, again, succeed with the cohorts that you were going after? Oh, I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. 
Thank you. That's a great question. And there are, are obviously a lot of food choices that families are making. So delivering de delicious and nutritious, accessible, affordable nutrition is at the core of everything we do. But what we heard um, and what we've tried to pivot from a strategy standpoint is in finding ways and, and times to speak to the consumer throughout their day and less about breaking it into day parts. Day parts was really something we saw a lot when folks were home, but now the day part has shifted and they're the ways that they're working and living um, are, are shifting. And so we've been more foundational in our approach. We've been more inclusive, but we've also been targeting um, behavior that we found was synergistic. And what I mean by that is we, we see that um, yogurt shoppers in particular shop and purchase a number of items and that it's expandable consumption. So when you have more in your fridge, you eat more and you serve it more to your family and you give more options to your kids and um, it's better, it's a better for you. So it's also okay to have that permissible indulgence item um, and, and serve that to your family too. It extends into the other categories that we play as well into coffee creamer and certainly into alternative milks. So I think it's, it's really about expanding um, your breadth and looking at what's naturally occurring in behavior and trying to target those shoppers and reward them for that behavior um, and also give a glimpse to trends and where you think the consumer's headed based on other categories, um, based on a lot of, you know, certainly data and insights that we get, but um, just in targeting the behavior that's naturally occurring. So um, I think there's a lot of ways in. If you want to give me one more specifically, I could maybe delve into it a little bit deeper, but um, we're looking at it in a lot of different ways. No, oh, that's great. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Great. Perhaps it'd be a good time to talk about uh, artificial intelligence that's been alluded to um, across, across the group. Um, so I would love to hear, uh, perhaps we'll start with Rhonda, um, with how, how are you actually using it uh, to date? Uh, where is it most effective? Um, and, and what is your view on this moving forward? Yeah, it's it's a fast evolving area for all of us, I think. Um, and there's three ways that we're using it today um, and constantly looking for additional uses. Um, first is in our creative. So how do we um, develop creative using AI tools so that we can be faster to market with our creative? We're beginning to explore production AI tools um, very, very early, but excited about what we're seeing. Um, we are using AI for personalizing some of our uh, digital content so that we can tailor those messages. And then um, my team is also exploring AI techniques for copy testing um, and have recently had some really good success um, getting even more rapid and I think clear diagnostic feedback using some AI tools to get copy tested. Great. And anything on the uh, the agenda for what, what's priority to, to automate next? I mean, the other thing that we're looking at is um, in the area of AI and machine learning is our demand forecasting. So how do we take those inputs and create an even more precise forecasting process. Um, it's something that we are constantly looking to improve so that we can maximize operational effectiveness. So that's one I know the team is really doubling down on right now. Great. How about you, Mike? You mentioned, uh, you know, using uh, insights gleaned in directly in marketing communication. Uh, how, how is AI playing a role at Constellation? Yeah, we're leveraging it in, in many of the same ways. And I, I would honestly say that we are, you know, still early in the game, very early stages of our, our engagement. The only thing that I might add that's a little, uh, little different uh, is our internal engagement uh, with uh, various uh, AI related tools uh, that are developed uh, behind a firewall by our own team so that our teams can begin uh, getting familiar with the technology and figuring out additional uses for it. So uh, still early on for us though, still learning. And Shannon, how about you? It's so similar um, to what Rhonda said, actually. So I think there's certainly a role for AI to play going forward um, in a couple of different verticals. So with data, certainly, um, and, and definitely in supply chain and manufacturing. But I think the, the ones that I'm closest to that we'll look um, for are speed to the consumer and speed to the shopper. 
And how can we get those messages tested? How can we get really great, strong copy that is personalized? And how can we deliver that with speed and not be restricted oh. by the timeframes that were maybe historical um, and with our partners and vendor partners? So I love those answers. And it was, we, as we were preparing for this, we were looking across a lot of the growth leaders and, and how they used AI. And you guys summarized it precisely how the majority of CPG is leveraging today. And it is early days. So we appreciate you guys sharing that. And I think that's going to open up new opportunities, which leads us to the last question before we open it up for Q&A. And I will remind the audience that if you have questions, please feel free to put it in the chat. Kara is going to start looking at those now, and we'll open that up uh, with our last few minutes. But because of what I think, you know, you guys have really done a phenomenal job, you and your teams, your companies, um, in finding growth in what has been unprecedented situation in the world and specifically the U.S. So now as we look into the rest of 24, where do you see your best and biggest opportunities that you're kind of trying to, to go after at this point? So um, Shannon, you're actually top on my screen right now. So I'm going to go to you first. Okay, good. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. You know, I, I think we're still on a journey and I think we'll always be on a journey to make social and environmental impact. And that's key to our success and something we're really, really excited about as we continue to look into 24. Um, good food has the power in households and with, with our consumers to improve everything um, in our lives, with our families, with our communities, with our econo economies and our environment. So um, we'll continue to work with really strong, talented people um, to make positive impact. So I think that's one thing socially and environmentally that we're, we're looking at. Um, I think the other thing that I'm really excited about for Chobani is the future in the future and in 24. You may have seen some really exciting news that came out at the end of last year. Um, Chobani has acquired La Colombe Coffee, and it's really the marriage of two amazing brands coming together in a natural family. So um, we share a commitment to quality and craftsmanship and, and also obviously to social impact. So we're really, really excited to bring coffee into the portfolio and um, talk to consumers more about about coffee, 90% of Americans consume um, caffeine daily. So we're, and 75% of those consume it cold. Um, so we're really excited about what that means to the coffee category and to the, to the overall brand. Thank you. Mike, how about you? Well, I'm one of those consumers of caffeine and coffee. So that's great. <laughs> um, <laughs> for us, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, what excites us or the biggest opportunity, I think is to keep the momentum going, particularly in, in our beer business. You know, there was a, a significant changing of the guard uh, in the beer industry last year when Modelo Especial became the number one uh, beer in the U.S. in dollar sales, uh, overtaking Bud Light. And so, you know, I thought, I, I think there's a still a big swath of uh, this country and consumers that, you know, aren't as familiar with the brand. And so, you know, many people were caught off guard. People that have been paying attention, you know, knew that that was going to happen eventually. I think some of the things that transpired in the industry uh, uh, over the past year have accelerated that trend, but we have an opportunity. We've got great, great momentum with that brand. There are still many uh, markets uh, across the country uh, that haven't been fully penetrated. Uh, and so I think continuing uh, the growth there uh, will be important as well in some of the, as well as some of the other sectors that we talked about aligned with consumer trends, betterment and flavor. Uh, as it relates to Modelo Oro, light beer uh, option, uh, Modelo Chiladas, and uh, Modelo Agus Frescas from a, uh, a flavor standpoint. Um, and then, you know, we've got emerging brands uh, uh, that are uh, up and coming, too. We've got a brand called Pacifico that, you know, started out uh, as a lifestyle brand. Uh, uh, it, it really resonates with adventure seekers. It started in the surfing community uh, when surfers would go down to Baja, California and bring the beer back. Uh, to Southern Cal uh, with them on their way back. And so that beer uh, is one of the most popular beers in Southern California and the LA market, which is the biggest uh, beer market in the country uh, and is beginning to get more exposure across the country. And so in the way that we try uh, to, to seed growth for those you know, brands like Pacifico, Modelo was an example from 10 years ago when we did the same sort of thing. 
Uh, we want to make sure that we're doing that in a focused and disciplined way, uh, taking taking our opportunity to make sure that people understand the brand and value proposition, get lips to the uh, get liquid to lips, as we call it in the industry, uh, because once they taste it, they love it. And so and then, you know, as it relates to we've talked a little bit about the industry dynamic and, you know, some of the proliferation on, on the shelf as uh, as suppliers try to develop products tailored to the changing or shifting preferences of consumers. In the way that we innovate and introduce innovation, uh, it's also an area where we like to think that we do so in a very focused and disciplined manner. We test small, we learn, and we expand from there. Uh, we are not a company that is going to, you know, throw uh, a lot of ideas uh, at the wall to see which stick in, in an effort to main, maintain a shelf space. We want to make sure that we're bringing value to it to our distributor partners and to our retailer partners in introducing products that have staying power on shelf in addition to resonating with consumer trends. So those are all areas that we're focused on. Um, we think 2024, calendar 2024 is gonna be a big year for us. Sounds like it for sure. And at Rhonda, at Pharmavite, what do you think your biggest opportunities are for this year going into 25 as well? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we're coming into 2024 with unprecedented momentum, I think, the last piece of data I looked at said we're growing eight times our category. So um, my team is very, very focused on continuing that um, growth trend that we have supporting us and giving us tailwinds. Really at the center of doing so is innovation and continuing to build on our brand strength. Um, innovation has been really crucial to the brand over the last five years, um, and that certainly is the case in 23 and 24, and even looking into 25. Um, and so we know that our brand wins when we find the intersection of scientific and consumer insight. Um, and that's really kind of what the brand was founded on and what we're really focused on delivering for our consumers. Um, we're really excited about our latest innovation. So we just launched a line of zero sugar gummies um, and have uh, established that platform. And that will be a key pillar for our brand going forward. Um, and I think it plays into some of the trends that we've talked about during this call today. Um, but you know, for us, it really just goes back to staying hyper-focused on keeping the consumer at the center of everything we do, nailing the fundamentals, and continuing to invest in, in innovation to grow the business. Well said. I think hyper-focused on the consumer is, is what I think all three of you have shared with us today, and I love all the stories. We probably have time for one or maybe two questions, Kara. So were you able to find any to... Uh, Sure. I, I think there's a, a common theme among the questions, um, which uh, is really around the, the inflationary environment we've just gone through, the increasing cost of living and pressure on consumers. Um, within this environment, you know, as we come out of uh, all the price increases that have happened, how do you approach price promotion and premiumization, how are you thinking about that uh, in your portfolios? Perhaps we start uh, with, with Shannon. You know, I think it's about, we believe in being responsible um, and accessible nutrition. So you will see us continue to be very, very responsible in that way and provide accessible nutrition. Um, we are one of the most nutrient dense foods in the category and certainly in the store as far as not having to cook, prepare. I mean, it's ready uh, for you with a spoon, so that's great. Um, but I think it's about, and I, I would say this to, to manufacturers, I think it's about being responsible um, and also to meeting the shopper where they are and, and providing price pack architecture and options that meet them where they are in all channels, in all areas of the marketplace. Rhonda, any thoughts from the uh, vitamin world? Yeah, I look. I think um, the vitamin world is is fortunate in that even in inflationary periods and economic downturns, consumers tend to turn to the category um, to help maintain their health. Um, so we we are fortunate in that, but we also have a, a very strong responsibility because Nature Made is. Um, founded on being a very accessible brand to help consumers manage their health and bring that gift of health to life. Um, so we've implemented a number of what we call invisible to the consumer cost containment measures 
um, and just looking at wastes uh, that we have in the company that we can drive costs out of our system um, because we faced the same cost pressures that I'm sure everyone on this call has faced over the last few years and didn't feel that we could pass those along to the consumer without first looking in our own operation to find some cost savings. So we've done that and then haven't had to pass on um, pricing to the level that we would have had to. And Mike, any other thoughts? Yeah, that's similar themes on this front. You know, fortunately for us, um, you know, the alcohol products that we sell are considered affordable luxuries. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, in, in, in times when consumers are um, watching carefully what they spend, they will typically cut on bigger ticket items. Um, but at the end of the week, when you're looking to unwind, you know, uh, our brands have been, you know, uh, of, considered affordable luxuries that at the end of the day, um, you know, are part of their kind of routines, uh, if you will, and they continue to purchase. I, I think for us, you know, disciplined approach towards pricing, um, and we've talked about that uh, ad nauseum for our business. So it, we, we, we maintain a, a, a discipline around, you know, a one to 2% price increase per year approach uh, in mind of consumers and uh, what's going on in their worlds. And then I think from a price pack architecture standpoint, offering options. What you often see is um, when people are watching and when consumers are watching their money, they may, they don't trade out of our brands typically, they'll trade down uh, to uh, a, a, a different price point, if you will. So we wanna make sure that we've got options that meet their needs at different pri price points uh, for different drinking occasions and situations. So uh, that is our approach. First of all, I've loved this. I could continue to talk to the three of you. So I know Kara feels the same way. Um, we are almost out of time. So I want to tease those of you that had other questions. We're going to carry those questions over to Thursday. And um, we want you to join us for our Thursday growth leaders, where we will be able to talk to Beatbox and Idahoan and be able to dig into some of those additional questions as well. But um, I, I wrote down several different themes. If any of you were watching me and were like, what is she doing? I was like taking copious notes because I was learning so much from each of you. But when I summed it up at the very last, I was thinking, all right, so each of you really did talk about accessibility. How can we make products within our portfolio accessible to the consumer? We want to be responsible about it. So each of you talked about how you were trying to price, getting that balance between cost containment and the price to the consumer, and that you each were taking kind of a disciplined approach in how you were going after it. But all three of you were very, very focused on the consumer in everything that you talked about today from from what you're doing, from your innovation to getting the product onto the street to talking about it with personalization, um, I think it speaks volumes to how you've been able to not only gain growth, but be, as you've all three talked about, consistently delivering, which is so, I just can't undermine the fact that that is not an easy thing to do. And you were among the best of the best in doing that. So with that, I want to thank you again for joining us. Um, thanks to everyone on the call for joining. We will have the replay and the um, charts that we shared earlier available on the console for you to download. But please joining us on Thursday for our second edition of the 2023 Growth Leaders. And until then, thank you so much and have a great race of the day. See you later.